Stephen Hayes, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm just so glad to be here. Yes, I want to talk to you about so many things, but but you're essentially you are one of the uh, foundational creators of something called ACT, right? Which is um, an acronym, which I'm I'm <laughs> embarrassingly blanking on. Acceptance. Well, you could do it two ways. It's acceptance <laughs> and commitment therapy, or acceptance and commitment training, and training. it turns out to be the same thing because it's not just for therapy; it's for human beings dealing with what they're dealing with. Right. And so I've been, you know, I'm a health coach, so I work on helping people change their behaviors, do different things, feel better in their bodies and their minds. And I, I started in the early 90s with, you know, imbibing all these theories. There was a pre-seed, proceed model, rational actor theory. Um, there was the trans, you know, trans theoretical model of stages of change. And, and then I got into cognitive behavioral therapy and CBT, and all of them had stuff to offer and all of them had things that were helpful. Nothing that I came across or read had a theoretical framework that was, that felt like it was complete and comprehensive until I read your book, A Liberated Mind. Um, can, can you just, before, I want to go into like your story and how it all came about, but, but, but if, could you just from your perspective, like what it was, missing or absent or underdeveloped when you went into helping people psychologically that you felt you had to like really do all this extra work yeah. to, 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 to create a foundation for? You know, it's a great question. And I have to say, in all of these podcasts and stuff I've been doing, Liberated in Mind, been out about a year. It's the best one I've had. It really is a good way to cast it. You know, what was missing? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what I sensed was missing, uh, coming from my background, was a, an account that was really started with the base for the foundation and took it all the way up to the point where normal human beings could apply it. So I, you know, I did work in basic psychology as well as clinical psychology as who I am. And when I sort of came into the theories that were there and that were trying to help people with mental health problems, but not just that, or living their lives. What it seemed to miss was, uh, why is it like that? Why is it so hard to be human? What are we trying to do anyway? Why do we get in our own way? Why do we have everything that the rest of creation needs to be happy and we're not? I mean, it just is a conundrum. The human condition is odd. It doesn't make sense. Because if you look around with the most successful species on the planet and with another frame, we're the least successful because no, there's no other species on the planet that can suffer amidst, yeah. plenty, amidst <laughs> plenty. And so I spent the time trying to basically hack the human mind before stepping into uh, here's how to help. I mean, that's not, it didn't go quite in that sequence because I was learning things that would help, but I wouldn't put things out that would say, here's how to help until I'd hacked it and the basic level enough. And that's what I thought was missing. There was no basic account. There was no explanation as to why this is hard. Mm. It reminds me of a, of a, a line from the poet David White. It said, uh, why are we the one terrible part of creation privileged to refuse our flowering? Yeah. I mean, it's just like a mystery, isn't it? I mean, you look around and, and the world feels upside down right now. Yeah. But it's always felt a little bit upside down. This is particularly upside down now. And uh, I think the whole culture worldwide feels it. I mean, what, you know, we're, we're on a trajectory here where you could say, oh, okay, I understand it. Uh, you don't have enough food to eat. Uh, I get it. Uh, you're in a war zone. There's less violence right now than there's ever been in the history of the human species. There's more, uh, there's less malnutrition, less starvation now. I mean, if you had to pick a time to be born right now, if you just, look, if you just looked around and said, okay, I'm a baby in the, the other plane of existence and I'm gonna land, but I don't know where, but it's on the earth. When should I do it? Now would be the best time to pick. Except mm. that rates of suicide, rates of depression, rates of anxiety, rates of PTSD, all these things, young people are standard deviation, worse off, blah, 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 those woe is me statistics we have. 
and just in terms of our physical selves, you know, eating the wrong things, failing to exercise, doing things that are not good for our health. Mm. And uh, I think there is a, an answer. There is a, a reason that it's like that. Okay. And I think and, we've kind of figured out a bit about why that is. So that's why when you read it, it sort of feels like, boy, that's complete. Yeah, because it was designed to be from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, other systems that have answers tend to be religions or spiritual yeah. traditions. And, you know, ACT resembles a lot of Eastern thought in terms of acceptance or, um, you know, or Stoic thought. Uh, sure. But you, but what was what I love about the book is sort of your your relentless commitment to a scientific underpinning. Yeah. Um, and I just I just love I, I was listening I read it and then I was listening to it again while jogging, and I kept sort of smiling on my jogs when you'd say, "Right now, ACT is good, but here's another therapy that's different that's actually been proven better for this." So I would do that right now using ACT, like the, like the humility of. Of, of saying, like, we don't know yet, we don't have enough information, but what, what do we know? So, like, what's the answer to that question? Why are we so effed up? Well, the answer that I came to, and I think in broad strokes, it's pretty likely to be so, is that we're dealing with an evolutionarily recent adaptation that you and I are doing right now. It's, you know, we're speaking and listening in symbolic ways. We could close our eyes and have this conversation, and we could imagine and, uh, what each other was like, but we could also imagine what we're talking about. We can, you know, there's no other species on the planet that can do that. They're, they're communicating, but mm. not in symbolic referential ways. And, you know, we know that the, that the chimpanzees don't do it because your 12 month old baby will do what will put it on the pathway to be able to to speak and listen and, and, and think symbolically by 12 months old, it's really clear. We, I, I think really the smoking gun shows up at around 12 months and I can say what that is. Uh, the language trained chimps, you know, years and years and years of training. I mean, I come out of the University of uh, Nevada in Reno, which happens to be in Washoe County in Washoe the chimp, you know, Alan and Trixie Gardner within my department and and they're not the only ones, but you probably have heard the term Washoe, or you maybe know something about the gardeners and their sign language and uh, chimpanzees. But it's not just them, the, the Sioux Savage and Dwayne Rumbaugh's troops in Atlanta and so on. There's been 30, 40 years trying to see, you know, why are we different than the chimpanzees? Or it's our closest relative. And um, some folks say, well, we're not that different. Yeah, but uh, we're having a conversation right now over the internet. I don't even know where you are. You could be anywhere. You could be on the other side of the world. I mean, think about it. What we're doing with science and technology and the fruits of this. So here's, here's the bottom line. The very things that allow us to succeed as a species, which is our problem solving abilities using this relational and symbolic ability will produce all of the problems that we're struggling with as human beings. And so if you don't know how to rein in the very tool that allowed us to succeed, uh, you're gonna end up with this conundrum of prosperity and misery within the same skin, within the same community. We've, we've gotta learn how to put our mind on a leash. We need modern minds for this modern world and the world gets more and more and more and more filled with not just the fruits of our ability to think and reason, but even the temptation to come into that network and take it to be whole and complete and believe what your mind tells you about who you are, what the world's like, et cetera. And it's, uh, it, it's not so smart. I mean, the things that it's telling you to do or who you are, a lot of it is just way off and uh, produces itself misery. So that's why so, our strength so, is our weakness. Yeah. Okay. So what's an example when you talk about like symbolic language or, you know, um, like chimpanzees who use sign language will use a sign yeah. for, for banana. So what are we doing symbolically that's orders of magnitude different and more powerful? Well, I dangerous? created a ditty for it. See, underneath the act work is relational frame theory, which is, uh, a, an evolutionarily sensible behavioral theory of language and cognition that has 
several hundred studies behind it now. And we're able to do things like take kids who don't think and reason symbolically, don't have a sense of self, can't engage in a normal language. And they're sufficiently neurobiologically intact with the proper training to bring, to bring them along. So we know how to take kids, uh, and developmentally disabled uh, kids and, and, and bring them along. Here's the, the uh, ditty that summarizes that 40 years of work is that we can learn it in one, but then derive it in two and put it in networks that change what we do. That's the ditty. And what that means is, uh, if you have even a 12 month old baby who learns that, uh, let's say, uh, this thing is a glass, and then I say, where's the glass? The baby will try to find the glass. Mm -hmm. the, the language trained chimpanzees respond at 50% as chance levels, 50-50 if you give them two to pick from, they won't know. If you learn it in one, they have it in one. Now, if you want it in two, you train it in two, and then you'll get it in two. You can train a chimpanzee that, a, you know, the, the sign for this is such and such, and when you have the sign, orient towards this. But okay. it has, each side of the street has to be trained. We create a two-way street, and it begins with names. That's the first one, simplest, the easiest. But then very, very soon, it's different. If you say to a baby, you know, where's the metronome? And it looks around, and it sees this and it knows it's a glass, hmm. and it sees this other weird object over there, it'll begin to derive that a metronome must be this. And I picked a word that's hard for a baby to say, but as soon as it can hmm. produce speech, it's like it under certain conditions, it'll say metronome. Hmm. So it'll produce it in that way too. You, you can learn it by what's called exclusion or there are frames of difference. And then we're off to the races. I mean, eventually, you know, you can say to a, you know, a two-year-old, which do you want a, you know, a dime or a nickel? And they get that already that you can buy candy with it and they want the nickel, it's bigger. He mm. said to a four-year-old, they want the dime, it's bigger. <laughs> so now we've got comparison being arbitrary. Well, if you just had that, if you had names, attributes, before and after and comparisons, you can say, yeah, I'm successful, but I'm not as successful as I should be. In the first mm -hmm. act book, I put a story that says, just like this, I think I can say it almost word for word. It was in the New York Times, and I think it was in 1975. A six-year-old girl threw herself in front of a train today. The authorities said her mother had died of a terminal illness. I mean, just think about it. A six-year-old can already have the tools to say, I'll be happier in heaven with my mother than to live here. Mm. And so is there anything more anti-life than taking yourself out by your own hand? Six-year-olds do it. Mm. Five-year-olds do it. Three-year-olds, no. Not even one example. Not one. Mm. It takes a, but it takes so little, so little for us to be so miserable. Mm. So that's it. We're playing with fire. We've, we're the, the, the ones that invented this wonderful tool of language and cognition, initially just out of cooperation, you know, bring me the apples uh, that I think that's really likely as the social monkeys that we are. We're not monkeys, but you know what I mean. Um, so uh, it makes a real challenge for us. And now we put it on steroids We've, with science and technology and the constant flow of information. And, you know, your 10 year old knows more than you, you knew at 18. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're just soaking in and they're overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. So um, in your, in the book, you talk about the, like why our thoughts are so convincing to us. Yeah. I think that, and that was the, the purpose of this relational frame theory, RFT. Um, you know, I'm thinking about like, I'm looking at you now over the internet. I'm remembering the stories of like the first movies, like this train that appeared on the screen, you know, very incredibly grainy black and white and people stampeded out of the theater in terror. Yes. Um, so <laughs> Like, is it's it something, funny. is it something like that, that we can, we're, we're created this symbolic language that, that essentially could have any relationship whatsoever to reality or none at all. 
and our brains convince ourselves that what we're thinking is the real thing. Exactly right. If we don't catch how that happens and then bring it to heal, which is difficult, this evolutionarily recent adaptation begins to take over things that are a thousand times older. Let me give you an example. The story that you tell about who you are and so forth sets up these midbrain structures, this narrative self that, be, that harnesses areas where sensory in, motor information can be filtered out. Literally what you feel and sense or see with your, with your sensory system will get filtered out as relevant or not relevant to this present moment based on the degree to which it fits within the story. So you don't even live in the world you live in. You live in the world that your narrative is construction, constructing for you. You literally don't know what's in right in front of your eyes. I mean, you can have somebody say, I love you, and it's not going to land if mm -hmm. you're living inside. Deep down, there's something wrong with me. And it's just an example. You know, it, it, you know this happens in other ways. I mean, uh, if you put a cat in front of a mouse, and then have a loud noise, what happens is the loud noise gets through, it heads up to the reticular formation and pfft, stops, it's not relevant. I'm looking at a mouse, mm -hmm. you know, so, and that's important. You've got to be able to have your underlying neurobiology enable you to focus on what's of important to, to eat and not be eaten. You know, it's down to that. Well, now we've taken the stories that we tell the thoughts that we have, the beliefs that we have, the comparisons that we're making. And it, we're, we're now deep inside the network in such a way that uh, it's doing the filtering for us without us even knowing while we're mm -hmm. asleep, you know, it's doing it constantly. So uh, yeah, it's, it's hard for us. So, but if we can rein in the problem solving analytical judgmental comparative problem solving mode of mind, we can have that repertoire and use it when we need it when doing our taxes, fixing our car, deciding what investments to make, whatever it is, and also have a mode of mind that's a lot more like just saying, wow, when you see a sunset or when you hear the story of a, an abused mm -hmm. child, you know, that we have the capacity just to observe and appreciate. And, it, you know, it, it's in our wisdom traditions, our spiritual traditions. It's just not the analysis, but some of the solutions are. I mean, contemplative practice will train a kind of broader attentional process that won't be kind of yanked away by the chain of, of uh, cognition as easily. You know, just sitting and following the breath, you know, your mind will give you a thousand and one reasons to follow it and eventually say, boy, you're doing a good job meditating today. And, Oh, what a wonderful insight. You should stop and write it down. I mean, it'll, <laughs> it'll give you every possible temptation. And if you're, you know, you have a good teacher, that too, you come back and follow the breath, come back and follow, training yourself a kind of a uh, attentional flexibility that puts your mind on a leash. But without that, mm -hmm. good luck. You got to mm -hmm. pray for only the right words to show up in your head or come in through your ears and that's just not gonna happen. You're gonna hear every disgusting, prejudiced, lousy thing. Or, I mean, how many things do you hate? How many things are, you know, all those things you know about, how do you know about them? You, you heard about them, what does that mean? They're in there. They're doing their dirty work even when you're not watching. I mean, you're biased, prejudiced, stigmatizing, fearsome, loathsome, weird, everything is in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, what are you going to do when well, nothing you do will do? You better right. figure out a way. <laughs> and that was a, you know, a very moving part of the book when you're, be, you're being very vulnerable and self-revelatory about thoughts you have, preju prejudicial thoughts. And, and for most of us, I think for me, for most of my life, the thought itself induced so much shame that I wouldn't even allow myself to think it. I would engage yeah. in all sorts of compensatory, uh, you know, uh, sure. acrobatics to, to not, because a person who thinks that thought is a bad person and I can't think of myself as a bad person. Um, yeah. 
Where does where does that come from? Well, and I mean, then the you know, effect you of you. the effect of that, of course. It isn't, now in some ways we want that because we don't want people kind of embracing their prejudiced thoughts and woohoo, you know, on the one hand. On the other hand, that kind of suppressive thing now means that it's important. You gotta avoid it. You gotta stay away from it. Yeah, and then so it's very easy to say things like, oh, I don't see color. Uh, you know, race means nothing to me. Yeah, dude, it's because you're white male and you get away with everything and it's built into your privilege. And, and what you're saying, you might as well say, yeah, I'm a racist. I'm the kind of racist that refuses to acknowledge the racism around me. Because you can't, because it's too painful. You know, and so what are we going to do with something like that? And I tell the stories in there. I have an African-American daughter. I've been married to two Latinas, you know, but you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish by the maternal line, and you know, half of my mother's relatives died in ovens because they were in the wrong category. And, uh, and that doesn't give me a pass. I, and I tell stories in there of catching, you know, racist thoughts rumbling around from my history, or actually know a few of them, even with regard to my own daughter. Mm -hmm. I had to tell her these stories at my age, you know, to, because I've, I'm ashamed enough about them. I didn't want to talk about them. And she was very sweet. And she's, uh, you know, a grown woman now and said, uh, you know, we all have those burdens to carry. And it's right. So, but can we find a way to carry burdens like that, that allow us to be honest on one hand and, and allow us to, uh, uh, do what is moral and, and ethical and what we really want to be about, but not in a suppressive way that ironically gives exactly what we don't want to have power in our life to have way more power in our life. Mm -hmm. And you picked a really good one, you know, and the, yeah. the Black Lives Matter thing that's happening now worldwide, people saying time's up and they're right, time's up, but you can't just fix it by shame and blame. You can't fix it by just wagging a finger at yourself. Yeah, which I think is, is so challenging interpersonally and societally, because it's because what we're asking people to do is very subtle and can easily be construed as permissive, like, oh, it's uh, your views are OK. You know, like if you if, if I go out and I, and I make a post, a social media post that just is angry and blames people for being jerks. I get lots of kudos for that. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and you see so much. I mean, self-righteousness isn't going to solve it. Take this issue of the bias between peoples. I mean, that is built in uh, to a degree, of course, because this the, uh, the negative side of uh, learn it in one, drive it in two, which was an extension of cooperation within your group, if I could ask for something and you could take perspective of me and we come into life even before language able to do that, we have some basic sense of theory of mind and intentionality, even before language shows up. Uh, you know, our ability to create this two-way street, I think, came because of that ability to take the perspective of the other. Mm -hmm. So the speaker may say glass, or let's say one that would be more likely and when we were hominids, uh, apple and the listener hearing it would derive that the speaker wants an apple mm -hmm. well that's already a two-way street and maybe i could then get you an apple so you could say apple from the other side of the ravine and maybe we'll be have apples brought to you you can't get over there but your friend is over there and you know that's all wonderful yeah but the very social fabric in which uh cooperation like that can be selected based on multi-level selection theory and evolution comes when groups compete. So yeah, we're the cooperative primates, we're the tribal primates. We're also the ones that uh, enslaved other of our own kind because there's, a, there's an us and them built into multi-level selection. You know, and when we were out there just those warring bands and tribes, you can get away with that. We can't get away with that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, global warming or uh, COVID, we're facing it right now. Where's the us and them? 
I mean, the only us is all of us. And the only them is another life form in the case of COVID or the underlying uh, success of the planet in the case of global warming. And so we're at a time now where the group has gotten so large that it's all of us. And that's, boy, mm. that's a challenge. Yeah. So, I mean, I was thinking about that when I was listening to that part of the book in that, you know, I work with people on health. And so, okay, we, I understand why you're addicted to junk food, because your organism is living in an unnatural environment. Completely in, crazy. Yeah. Right, in which your impulses are, let me get as much sugar as I can, because that's going to help me survive. Yeah. Or I'm not going to exercise because my nature is to conserve energy whenever possible. Sure. And you're also saying that, like, it's in our nature to have an us and a them. And we're now in an environment in which that's just as dangerous as eating every Snickers bar we can get our hands on. Exactly. That's exactly right. In fact, that's one of the best ways I've ever heard it said. You've done it twice to me, dude. <laughs> you're, you're, thank you for that. That's a real, I'm going to steal that thought, but that's exactly right. It's, it's uh, you know, evolutionarily, of course, you want to be attracted to salt and sugar and things like that. I mean, no fat, etc. You just do the math. You, you know, it makes perfect sense in terms of how much was available and what you're trying to do, energy conservation. All those things make sense. And... We have this other paradox of uh, amidst plenty, we have rates of, uh, you know, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, that are just uh, off the charts, don't make any sense. Uh, and not just that. And here we are with, what do we do with the prejudice and stigma and Black Lives Matter? And, th and they do. And how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that in a world that doesn't make it easy for us we better you know really here's what my my answer to that is what we're going to need is good old-fashioned western science number one that's honest bold you know that's going to go anywhere that you need to go and is able to say to the sugar industry no is able to say no we're not going to you know put uh, vending machines with uh, you know, soda pop in our elementary schools and, you know, that will, you know, use the information or say, no, you cannot be uh, continuing on this path of energy use that will mean make the planet uninhabitable for our great grandchildren, if not our grandchildren. And on and on it goes. The same thing applies with our ability to regulate our behavior and our psychology. And I look at the world, I look at things like COVID and so forth, I don't see psychologists there except here's how to deal with you know, trauma and anxiety and depression, but nothing about how to change your behavior. Yeah. Don't touch your face. Okay, well, I, I, how are you gonna do that? Just don't do it. Right. Were, did, weren't you ever a parent? What, did, what happened when you tell your kids, just don't do it? I mean, you know, don't put beans in your nose. This is, I mean, parent knows, don't ever say that to them. They're going to do it. Yeah. Well, so on and on it goes, you know, that we just have not had a cultural conversation that is science-based about the reality of being human that allows us to filter out the woo-woo and get down to the smallest set of things that will make the biggest difference. And what you saw in the book that you like, and you are unusual to focus on that. Thank you for that. Is, uh, is that very spirit? And that very spirit is what we're going to need with diet and exercise and health. And it's what we're going to need with uh, how can we be whole and free inside the modern world? Mm. Well, let's let's use that as a segue to find out how to be whole and free yeah. uh, inside the modern world. You you talk about the the dictate the inner dictator. Yeah. Right. And I I, I love that. Um, I've done some work with a with a with a process that's related to uh, Jack Trimpey's rational recovery, which is mm. sort of like basically like creating a, a another character in your head that you can blame for all of your bad thoughts. <laughs> right, which is not exactly the dictator, but, but no, but it's well, one reason to sort of call it that in a way, it, you know, is just to get us a little bit of separation. It comes from that same spirit that's in rational recovery. But you know, this problem-solving mind 
the the analytic judgmental comparative abilities uh, that are great with regard to you know problem solving that where that's needed you know doing your taxes fixing your car but when it's applied to yourself you know you turn your life into a problem to be solved and and hmm. once you're there there's always going to be on the list of pro, pros and cons just as many cons as there are pros and so you never get your way into peace of mind you never really get your place you know, place into a place where where love is worth the risk or or you know that where the pain that comes from loss uh it doesn't overwhelm the the uh yearning for purpose and contribution I just, yeah i just want i want to stop and react to what you just said and i've and i've heard it on the audio and i've read it but when you it really just like pierced my heart personally like turning your life into a problem to be solved like yeah. i feel like that's that's my 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 baseline addiction yeah and i feel and I'm, I'm hearing how i do that as a coach in in a very well-meaning way yeah and 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 you know and i think it's fine if we can rein it in when it's not fine so it, we're back to the same conundrum i don't want to be a dog or a cat you know my little dog dioji if he were just let free it would be eaten by the coyotes out here in a matter of minutes. You know, but uh, I don't want to be in that situation. I want to be a whole human being. I want to have this capacity to problem solve and reason, but I don't want it always to be dominating. I want a place where I can put down that burden, where I know how to do things like forgive or to just let go or to show up or to love to relax, to, to simply be. And so, um, you know, we don't come out with an owner's manual, so we, we do what's logical, reasonable, and sensible, but often that's what's pathological. Mm -hmm. Well, cause, I mean, as I think about it, like when I think about, okay, if life isn't a problem to be solved, I'm pretty untethered a lot of the time. Like, well, what, what are the rules? Yeah. What is, you know, you know, just being, I turn just being into a problem, right? Like I can, <laughs> I, can, like, yeah. I, can I can meditate as a solution to all of my problems. Like, oh, if I can just identify with transcendent spirit, then the problem of how are you solved? Yeah, exactly. Well, and you know, a good teacher, if you're, if you're in a Eastern or mindfulness kind of tradition, not just Eastern, this is in all of our wisdom traditions, including Western religions, all of them, uh, have at their core mystical experience and mystical uh, leaders who had mystical experiences. They all do. And, and they all, in the mystical experience, you know, some, in the 90 percents and above, human beings say they've had spiritual experiences. And I believe them. And you ask them about it, and they say that there's some sort of sense of connection, timelessness, universality, time, place, and person drifts away. Uh, you know, ACT is being heavily used now in psychedelic therapy. And, uh, you know, people of my generation, uh, old enough to have sat on Hippie Hill in the panhandle of uh, San Francisco, you know, we explored that part too. And, it, well, so, you know, learn the, finding a place in which we can sort of put that down and be able to use it when it's useful and not use it when it's useful is the game. And to me, that means we need some guidance, and I think Western science will help. What the psychological flexibility model says, in answer to your question, is the tools that we need are to be able to back up from our thoughts, open up to our feelings and sensations in a way that allows us to take what's useful inside them, come into the present moment deliberately as a conscious human being, recognizing this basic I hear now awareness that connects me in consciousness to you right now. And from there to be able to attend towards what's meaningful, important as a matter of choice. What are the qualities of doing, of being, of life itself, life's moments, the qualities of it, not the outcomes from it, that we want to instantiate, that we want to uh, uh, give an example of, exemplify. And can we build habits around that? Those are six things. And that, that's the hack. I mean, if you had to pick six things that will make a profound difference in your life, I just said what they are. 
and they hang out together. When you try to measure them, it turns out if you're doing one and not doing the other, you have a hard time fully doing the one. It's like sides of a box. They're only strong when they're all six there and they're put together in the proper way. So, uh, and, and ironically, all of us know it. We actually know this. We even know it without spiritual leaders telling us or whatever. You can easily show that people know mm-hmm. that they do better when they're open, aware, and actively engaged in life than when they're closed off, uh, mindless, and being avoidant or driven by fame, money, or other kinds of uh, things that are not intrinsically important. Well, one of the things I noticed when I read about these six, as you call them, pivots in, in the book, is that all of them are obvious, they're commonsensical, I've heard them before, I've done them before, and they're all counterintuitive in the moment. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, that's beautiful. You have in, in the moment, you know, you're pulled to do the opposite. And yet, you know full well that it's a wiser thing to do. So you get pulled in. Who's doing the pulling? We're back to the dictator within. We're back to the evolutionary mismatch. We're back to this thin cortical over, overlay, you know, actually harnessing ancient neurobiological systems for its own purpose. It's like some sort of virus or disease or parasite or something almost. And we can't just root it out, dig it out and get rid of it because it's central to our success as a species and as individuals. So uh, that's the conundrum is that we're constantly doing things that deep down we know is not gonna liberate us, hoping that this time it will and being actively told literally but through images and words and symbols, this time for sure. I mean, it's Lucy's football. It's yeah. really gonna, it's gonna happen this time. You know, you're gonna talk yourself into self-esteem. You're gonna feel great. You're gonna solve yourself as a problem. You know, now you're just gonna have another round of, uh, uh, maybe I'll start living later. Well, and one of the things that I'm challenged by in your work um, is that like you you um, portray this as it's part it's an inevitable part of the human condition based on who we are as opposed to these are pathologies that are instilled on us when we're young. So I know you you know you talk about some very traumatic experiences as a child in your own development of of anxiety and panic attacks. The um, the who is it the preface of the book the uh, was or the, uh, I guess it was a, um, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, um, you know, praised the book. He's on the back cover. Yeah. His, uh, you know, my understanding of his view is that it's like tra- childhood trauma is the cause. And if we could have a society in which children were raised properly, we would be different. I think th- to some extent there's overlap, but also you're saying like, this is our wiring. And so we, which in a way is liberating. Like if I, th- if I think about the ways in which I was messed up as a child, I can be very resentful. And like, sure. that was unfair and it shouldn't have happened. And if only, like I would be a good, I would be happy now if only that hadn't happened. And you're kind of saying that. Yeah, that, you know, on the one hand, you want to say, let's create a nurturance society. Let's really try to be there. Let's, you know, reduce these insane levels of, uh, trauma and abuse. Of course, you'd, you'd want to do that. On the other hand, uh, let me give you an example. I, w- I was uh, doing a training and kind of walking through some of my own history, history of others, and it, you know, not by accident. Many of the people who are involved in, in the ACT work have, you know, visited uh, pain directly. I mean, that's why they're psychologists and stuff. They saw it in their family, they saw it in their own heart and so forth. And this um, graduate student comes up to me almost ready to weep. I can tell that there's a kind of, and she says, I don't think I'll be a good act therapist. I haven't suffered enough. Mm. And she's almost crying. You know, it doesn't matter <laughs> because <laughs> the, the basic mechanism of comparison and pain and stuff, if, if you live a life of privilege, you'll wonder, uh, did I deserve it? 
and is that fair? And, you know, maybe I, you know, so I, I asked people, you know, where's the, how tall were you? I usually do it by just holding my hand and say, give me a nod when that gets short enough. How tall were you when you first had the thought that maybe you're not lovable, maybe you're not good enough? And man, you get, your hand gets down to the point where it's three or four or five years old. You know, in elementary school, people are mm -hmm. having thoughts about their and that their adequacy. I write in the book, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I've got four wonderful, wonderful children. Every one of them in the elementary school years came to me with questions about why they shouldn't commit suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't talk about this, but I mean, that's not uncommon. If you're thinking, no, I just raised a bunch of weird kids. No, it's not. It's not, you know, something like half of the human population will for two weeks or more struggle with suicidal thoughts. Half of the human population. 98% of the human population admits they've had a suicidal thought and the other 2% are lying. You know, something like 10% will make an attempt so, you know, it's just freaking hard to be human. And yeah, I don't want that to mean take the gas pedal off the cultural conversation we need to have to be there for our kids and give them the foundation for a successful life. Don't make it hard on them and recognize that uh, while pain is universal, suffering need not be. And if we don't give our kids the tools they need to step up, they're going to suffer. Can I give you an, ex an example? Um, yes, please. Okay, so uh, just take, if you had to pick three things that are really quite uh, toxic, one of them would be constantly exposed to aversive events, right? That's part of why we don't want to have trauma. Right. Have you watched your television lately? <laughs> I don't have one, but I get plenty on the news. Yeah. And uh, do you feel a little, it, can you feel that this is almost traumatic? I was, I came into the kitchen today after my run talking to a friend and my daughter was making breakfast and I saw my wife and I said, boy, you know, I think, are we going to put our house on the market? Because it really looks like this country could turn fascist and yeah. And my daughter was like, ah, stop it. I'm trying to have a good day here. Exactly. And I had the same conversation this morning with my 14 year old. Same conversation. So how is that? Okay, so that's one. Constant exposure to pain. Here's another one. Constant exposure to comparison. Mm. You know, you just look at what our young people are doing. You know, they're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. What's in there? A ginormous amount of comparison. And often very cruel kinds of things. People will say stuff in the internet and anonymously and stuff that they would never say in per person. And even if they didn't, you can go to the Instagram posts and you can see the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful outsides. But then when you're looking at it, if you were to check in, you're seeing insides that are not so wonderful. So that's the second one, that's comparison. And then the third one, these three things together predict misery as far as, I mean, they're kind of a, the, the shorter version of the whole psychological flexibility model we've been talking about is uh, not knowing how uh, to show up when painful stuff shows up, running away when it's hard. So take those three of comparison, judgment, and experiential avoidance, and you've got the toxic triad so it is built into our, uh, our, our situation unless, so if I had to pick something, I'd say, yeah, let's not, you know, abuse our children. Let's nurture them. And let's allow them to be exposed to small amounts of distress in, meaningful, in a meaningful frame and to learn that their own pain is not their own enemy. 
And, you know, we used to do so much better job of that. I mean, my mother would drag me off to the stations of the cross. I'm Jewish by the maternal line, but she had converted to Christianity in which as a young child, you're supposed to be on your knees, you know, going from one thing to another. And then in the early days, listening to Latin, you didn't even know what the heck was going on. Was I happy about that? Did I like that? No. What did my mother say? She'd say, offer it up, dear. Offer it up. Me meaning what? See, meaning connect yourself to the suffering of others. Offer it up. And so, and she would say, you know, there are people who are starving right now. You know, so that it, it was, you know, we were, we were supposed to fast. We were supposed to sacrifice. You know, when Lent came around, you had to give up something. It was, it was important that it had to be something you really liked, something you really wanted. Mm. There are times where you had to fast. You didn't eat meat on Fridays. I was raised in a Roman Catholic uh, tradition. But, you know, you look around, all of the all of the traditions have this. They have periods of fasting. They have periods of, you know, they're of sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. Where is so, that in the modern world? Yeah. So there is it. Religious traditions are, they have some psychological wisdom to them if they've survived for thousands of years. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not creating a world simply of butterflies and rainbows, but when you say giving, giving you a meaningful context for witnessing the distress in the world. Exactly. And, you know, and my colleague, David Sloan Wilson, wrote a book, a really good one I recommend, called Darwin's Cathedral, walking through the evolutionary reasons. He's an atheist, mind you, but the evolutionarily sensible reasons for our, our spiritual and religious traditions in terms of how they help us adapt to the challenges of the world. Well, I can look at things like uh, the, the uh, traditions of self-sacrifice, of, of small amounts of distress experienced in a meaningful context. Well, if you take that out then, and, and you take the importance of nurturance and you don't want abuse, next thing you know, you're a helicopter parent if you're not careful. And the precious little deers, you know, deers don't have to do so much as fix their own lunch. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, as, as, as a high school student, I mean, you know, as a university professor, I can tell you, I mean, there are parents calling and, and challenging and pushing and about the least little thing that there, that is an issue, but that students should deal with mm -hmm. in college. Yeah. <laughs> but mom's going to do it. Dad's going to do it. Why? Well, this, so I, uh, I'm going back to your thing of would we solve it? Because it, it didn't quite face it this way, but could we solve the difficulty of being human by removing the painful challenges that we've had as children that our minds tell us are why we suffer. Mm. They are why we're in pain, that's true. I mean, but it isn't why we suffer. Because why? Because suffering requires uh, a rejection of your own experience. It's right in the word. It has a, the, the fair part of suffering comes from the word that that uh, means a ferry boat or ferrying. A, a, oh. It means to carry, and the suff part is up and under. Like we've got up and under the pain, and we're carrying it like a burden. That's suffering. How do you put it down? You don't know what mm -hmm. painful thing is going to happen. A good friend of yours may have died in our, during our conversation. You're going to get the call as soon as the Zoom meeting's over. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live long enough, all those things are coming. I mean, you gradually will lose your functions. You live long enough. Your, your, your friends will die. You live long enough. You just go through the list. So happy, happy, joy, joy. Let's not have any abuse. And that means we don't have any pain. And that means we'll all be happy. No, that's not so you can have even indulgence will produce suffering so there's a there's a jewish tradition that the the obligation of a father is um basically threefold to teach the torah to teach the tradition to his child um to teach them a way of making a living and to teach them how to swim and i've <laughs> 
I've sort of translated that as I like basically I want to teach my kids to make a living so they can afford therapy and to give them enough psychological insight to know that they are, they're going to need it. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, I do think we need it. And, but now, okay, but just take that issue of therapy, you know, and let's make sure that the kind of therapy that we're putting out there is evidence-based and empowers people, not just, to deal with mental health problems, but to live their life whole and free. We're back to that. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that we can do that, not just in therapy, we can do that in many of our roles. I mean, teachers can do that and coaches can do that and business leaders can do that. And when you know what the, what the processes are, and ironically, it'll make you more successful in all those roles, you as an individual, It'll be helpful to you in terms of powering, empowering you psychologically, but it'll also make you more successful. And so I, my vision would be, uh, let's put the help we need from psychology and behavioral science into all of the gatekeeper kind of functions where people have natural opportunities and willingness to learn. And that means at school, yeah, but that it also means in uh, your um, required diversity training in your work site. Mm. It means in your health and wellness program. It means, uh, you know, in your, um, in your church. It means, so like we, uh, that last one is an example the chaplains of the U.S. military have adopted motivational interviewing, problem-solving therapy, and ACT, and they teach all their chaplains these three things. Why? Because they've realized they have to empower their, the, the recruits as to how to get through their uh, training well and to function well, and that they go to see their minister, their rabbi, their uh, a mom and whatever, uh, rather than seeing the shrinks, because they go on a list if they see the shrinks. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See, so, we're, we're, that's a beautiful example. Put it, put what is helpful to people everywhere. What where where my mind just went was, what would an act informed military look like? Yeah, like, on the big scale, like we probably do a lot less dumb shit in the world. Absolutely, we would, and and you know. There's parts of the military tradition that are like this. I mean, the samurai were meditators. I mm. mean, it, it, and do you know that there's actually been randomized trials of ACT, of mindfulness training, et cetera, with pre-deployment and post-deployment in the military. It's just very hard to get it into their cultural traditions. They know that uh, they will have recruits who are better able to do it. We, we, I did a project uh, with submariners. Submariners get talked into the, the service, you know, and then they find out, oh my God, I'm in this metal tube without even a bed that I can call my own underneath water for one of the nuclear ones for months at a time. By the way, if they, if they sank, you know, we would have to die a miserable death. I mean, this is one challenging role, be a submariner. And we did act pre-deployment. We found that they worked through their training guidelines faster than if they hadn't had it, they were more likely to be successful as recruits. Is that in our, their boot camp? Is that in their military training? No, it's not. You know, what's in there is uh, very often what's been there for hundreds of years and I actually had a general say to me when I was explaining some of what's there and what we'd found in some of our earlier mm. studies and stuff, he said, oh yeah, well, that's all very good, but that's not the way I, it was done with me. And uh, I turned out pretty well, you know, like in other mm. words, uh, I'm, go I'm gonna visit hell on them just like was visited on me. Well, you're gonna get uh, rates of suicide, which they have, domestic violence, which they have, alcohol and drug abuse, which they have, that will make it very difficult for them to function as a fighting force, which they have. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, pay me now or pay me later. I mean, you either show up to these problems and deal with them in a healthy way, or they come back and bite you. And somehow, in area after area in our culture, we're still thinking we can get away with doing things that are unwise and not pay the cost. It's not true. Do you know the single most common cause of worker absence in the world last year? Depression? Depression. It was number five, then four, then three, then two, then one. I mean, it's now not, it's not back pain. It's not, no, it's depression. And so, you know, how much of this can we carry as a human community? You pay for that in every product you buy. And that's maybe a crass way to say it, but you also pay for it in the human cost of lives that are not being lived. So yeah. how are we going to do it? Yeah. How are we so, going to wake up? Yeah. Um, I want to give people a little taste of yeah. act in practical. Right? I'd, I'd love to do yeah. the whole th the whole thing. It would take seven or eight hours. But as as a coach, one, the thing that has shifted my uh, practice the most in just the short time that I've been engaged with act is the part about values. Yeah. So the way I would the way I would do it is okay. Well, humans have two motivations. You know, basically heaven or hell. Right, I can either like approach something, avoid something, gain pleasure, avoid pain, and then the third one was habit. Like you, you use motivation to get people to adopt habits, and then their motivation doesn't count anymore because it's a habit, and that worked okay. But there were a lot of times where people, because heaven and hell are generally in the future, or if you're in hell, the thought of getting out of hell is in the future. And what I got from from ACT is the importance of, I can live my value now. Exactly. I, can, I can be in a kind of heaven now, even while my body's in hell, even while I'm still engaged in the struggle, that, that being in concert with um, intentionally noticed and chosen values is better than getting to my goal weight. Exactly, I mean, values don't go away. I mean, they are constant, they're immediate, and they never give up. You can change them. It's not that you, you know, you, as you think it through, your values may change over time. And when you embrace your values right here, right now, you're in a different state. And moment by moment by moment, that's true. And unlike, uh, you know, pursuing positive and avoiding negative, when those things are achieved, they're done, they're finished. Yeah, well, values are never done. I mean, it, what values are, are these chosen, embraced qualities of being and doing. Uh, and they're, they're there. They're, we yearn for uh, uh, meaning and purpose. And, and this is something that language is really our friend because it allows us to sort of embrace these kind of abstractions of qualities that we want to instantiate. If you think of uh, a common way that I ask people to sort of think about that, take a particular domain and think of a hero that you have, anyone in that domain. And I just don't, can almost guarantee you that you didn't pick a hero because of the car they drove or how big their house is, how big their bank account is, how many people applaud. You picked it because there was something that you saw in that person that reflects how you want to be. That's a value. And when you embrace it, you're on the journey towards it. Now, how to build it out into your life's moments? Well, that's, an, that's a continuous pro process. So if you pick somebody, like let's say, mm, you pick your grandmother because uh, you know she was always there for you. Well, that tells you something about behaving in a loving way that's there for people around you. You want to do that, or you wouldn't have said that's your hero. You want to be like that. Mm -hmm. Well, what would it take for you in this moment to have this very moment we're doing right now be about being there for others in a way that's loving? Well, it might mean answering, asking really good questions in the podcast. It might mean trying to answer questions in a way 
that is not about sounding clever or, or looking good, but about serving folks who might listen to it later on. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you do that, and if that's the positive thing, when would that go away? When would that disappear? When would you have enough? Is it like eating pie at Thanksgiving? I'd say, no, it's not like that because it's continuous and it never, it, there's never enough. It's constantly available. It's always available and it's never fully satisfied because it's only exemplified. And so it's like walking west, no matter how far west you go, there's more west to go. And so that's a wonderful thing, thing to have as motivation because it means it's inexhaustible and it's always present. Woohoo! And we're the only ones that can do that. We are the only creatures that's from this language ability. It's just like your appreciation of a sunset and saying, wow, how beautiful. You know, it has something to do with your symbolic mind. You can say how pink, how beautiful. Uh, aesthetic appreciation and so forth, but uh, but not this problem-solving mind. So let's let's use this other parts of our mind that allow us to have meaning uh, uh, and purpose, continuously lifting us up. That's what the values work is about. Right, and related to values in a way that I don't totally understand, but I don't. I'm not sure that it matters. I did a, I did a, an exercise with a group that I coach um, called Just Cause. Yeah. Right. That uh, that I discovered in uh, Liberated Mind. Can you talk about that? And because it seems to be sort of opposite to choosing important values. Because I know I, I had a sense that in my coaching group, they were so attached to those va- to their values that they were actually making themselves feel bad for not achieving them. Every yeah. Exactly. Every exactly. So it's another example of no matter what we do, the dictator within part, the, the evaluation, comparison, problem solving part, will grab it, say, oh, I've got it, and will tell us a story. And next thing you know, it's messing it up. So uh, the just cause thing is uh, focused on this issue of choice. What does it mean to embrace a value and uh, to do that with your whole heart? and to not have to explain to the dictator within why. As soon as you say why, it's now conditional. The reason why I value this is, well, then the real value is whatever you just said, it's the, not the value, right? Uh, okay, so I love my wife, why? Oh, she's so beautiful. Uh, well, I hate to tell you, but she just had a car accident and uh, I can mastic, you know, magically see forward, and I can tell you she's, her face will be disfigured for the rest of life, and people will actually cringe when they see her. What are you going to say? Oh, yeah. Time for a new one. <laughs> no, I love her. Well, then why did you say you loved her? Because she's beautiful. What did you mean by that? Now, maybe you meant an inner beauty or something. Okay. But be careful, be careful, dude, because your mind doesn't know how to do this. It doesn't know how to freely choose things. And those, this problem solving knows that mind knows how to predict and compare. Well, leaps of faith, leaps of wholeness, peace of mind, values, choices, being able to say this. And when you say why, you say what you knew to say when you were four or five years old and you long ago forgot. You know how to rein in the dictator within, you say, just cause. In other words, I own it. Sue me if you don't like it. You know, period. You know, a sentence written with a period. This is of importance to me. Why? This is of importance to me. Why? just because so that we we actually need some of the wisdom that we had before we learned to give all the reasons and explanations we actually did a study years ago my colleague uh, and friend the late neil jacobson developed a measure of this it was some of the early act work and we asked people why around all kinds of things in their life and and this is work we wanted to focus on depression so we would ask you know why are you feeling depressed why are you not doing this why are you we asked okay here's the the finding 
the more reasons people gave and the more elaborated reasons they gave, the more stuck in their depression they were and the least less likely they were to be helped by psychotherapy. Mm. All this why, 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 why stuff is dancing to the tune of the dictator within as if, what, you have to get permission from part of your mind to be able to live? I mean, it's really bossy and it wants to know why because that's the part that we're talking about, the part that problem solves. So it's a good tool to have to know how to put a period at the end of a sentence. <laughs> Okay. And what, one other um, exercise that I love, and I don't exactly know why I love it or why it's so powerful, is repeating negative words over yeah. and over again. Can you talk about, first of all, where, where that, what part, what pivot that is, and what that comes from? The pivot is that we yearn for understanding, we yearn for meaning, and, and we, but what we mean by understanding once we get problem solving language going, that everything fits together. Yeah, but the problem is you got so much stuff you're carrying around that is inconsistent. You can always do a pro and a con, always. There's always a but. I love my wife, but you can fill out that sentence. Don't let her read it, but you could do it. Of course <laughs> you can do it. And guess what? Your mind's doing it. You're just not saying it out loud. You know, so how do you actually you know, deal with this yearning for things. Well, some thoughts are helpful in a given moment, some are not. So how do you get to that point where you can still have thinking, but not have it dominate you in that way? Well, we've de developed these methods, we call them diffusion. That's a made up word, not diffusion, D-E, fusion. Uh, uh, me meaning, being able to step back from our mind, see what it says, see what that is meaningful, but with a little bit of space between the observer and what you're observing. So you have some choice as to whether or not you're gonna use that thought. When you use it, now it's coherent in a different way. It's helpful. Okay, great, that's useful. But figuring everything out, not so much. So how do you do that? Well, we've come up with hundreds, hundreds of these things. And in my books, I teach people how to develop it. but we discovered one that the father of American psychology, Titchener, um, one of the fathers anyway, uh, 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 developed, which is word repetition. And he, he did it to show how language works, that words have meaning and context. And so what we found is that if you take a negative thought and you distill it down to a couple of words or ideally even one. It actually works better. We know if it's one rather than two rather than three or four. As you get more words, they hang together better. They support each other. Get it down to one and say it out loud fast for 30 seconds about at least once per second. Just do it. So, for example, I'm coaching someone who says, well, they can't commit to this because they're lazy. Yeah. So... The word would we'll be lazy. The word lazy, all right? Mm -hmm. So you just say the word lazy once and man, it has a punch to it. Oh, it's heavy. You've heard it so often. You've thought it so often. And I'm just lazy. Other people have said it maybe even, or you fear that they might have said it. You certainly thought it. It really is true. I'm lazy. No, I'm not lazy. I do. Oh yeah, you are lazy. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You get into that little dialogue inside your head. Just say lazy, 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 lazy for about 30 seconds. You can actually time yourself at least once per second. We've done the studies on it and we've come up with 30 seconds as the sweet spot. That's why I recommend it at least once per second for the same reason. We've actually done this research. Two things happen. Distress starts dumping really fast. And then believability behind that. Mm -hmm. The word starts losing its meaning. Right behind that, you start noticing some things. You notice the sound of the word. You notice how hard it is to say it. You don't notice when you're normally talking that you're engaging muscles in talking. But when you mm -hmm. say the same thing repeatedly, that becomes real obvious to you. It turns into 30 seconds. I have a hard time even saying it because your muscles start fighting you. Well, so what? Well, the point is, here you're have been running away for maybe decades for their whole life from lazy, which at another level is also just 
a word. And if I just were to say that to you, it's just a word, it'd be, yeah, but it's really true. You just do lazy for 30 seconds and see how it lands. And something shows up, it's like a fog lifts. Hmm. And you realize you're living inside a story, you're living inside categories, judgments, predictions, comparisons, all the time. And we're back to that point, you know, of even that narrative sense of self is even filtering out other information. You don't notice that, that lazy has a sound. You don't notice that when you say it repeatedly, you know, that the beginning and the end of the word actually can begin to blend or you can hear the, the music of it. People tell me that uh, normal English or not English speakers sound something like this. It sounds like a bad Texan, but we would say easily, you know, that Swedish sounds like you, know, <laughs> you would do that. Yeah. In Sweden, uh, you can't do that. They don't know what the music of Swedish is. They're not hearing the music. They're listening to the freaking words. Right. So, you know, we're swimming in a stream and not noticing that there's water. Hmm. And so 30 seconds, just try it. And it's one of hundreds of things we've developed. If people want a quick boost on that, go to uh, uh, the uh, TEDx uh, talk I gave uh, to uh, the school of people with IQs at the 99.9th percentile uh, of teaching them how to back up a little bit from the problem solving mind because they're brilliant. I mean, they, they have the problem solving mind on steroids. And I go through about 12 of these things like repeating or giving your mind a name or saying your words in uh, the voice of your least favored part politician or a cartoon character <laughs> or, and then I finish this. So, you know, I'm not making fun of the mind picture yourself as young as you were when you first had the thought that you're lazy. Really take your time to picture that. And then take that thought that you've been having recently about how lazy you are with your exercise program, put it coming out of the mouth of that young little boy or girl. I actually have the kids say it. I'm lazy. Mm. And what would you do if you could meet yourself at that age? And my guess is you're not gonna say, uh, snap out of it or what's wrong with you, or oh no, you're not. You're probably gonna wanna just hug the kid or do something. Mm. So could you do that to yourself in front of the mirror to this morning? Mm. Can you treat yourself the same way you'd treat a child suffering with the same thing? And so uh, diffusion is about self-kindness about stepping back and seeing how the mind works. We're being programmed. You know, Mary had a little <laughs> lamb. Lamb. Okay, try really hard to come up with something that has absolutely nothing to do with lamb in any way. Okay, give it. Mary had a little um, microphone. A microphone. Okay. So here I'll give you a little comparison. Hot. Cold, right? Yeah. Fast, slow, microphone, <laughs> lamb. lamb. Exactly. There you are. So the, the, the fact that you come up with something that has absolutely nothing to do with lamb doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything to do with lamb. What you did was it's not same as lamb. It's different uh -huh. from lamb. Uh -huh. Yeah, but in other contexts, and people listening to us right now, the next time they see a microphone, are going to think of a freaking lamb. <laughs> That's how, and, and by the way, if that were really awful, let's say that was a prejudiced thought, going back to that earlier one, or that's right. some sort of weird sexual thought, or that's a violent thought, is it? Man, you're, you could head on the road with OCD on that. You know, don't show me the microphone. Well, I don't think yeah. the bad word. <laughs> I'll ask you about that because in, in our community around, you know, eating and, eat, and disordered eating and, and binge eating and addiction, there's there's a school thought that like you get it out of your house, right? It's out of your house. 
If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. The, the, yeah. the, you, know, you walk by the cabinet and you see the chocolate, you're going to eat the chocolate. What I got from a liberated mind is that we do that to ourselves all the time through this kind of like framing of mental blowback that the very things we're trying to do to th when we think about exercising, we've tied it in our minds to overeating. Right? Yeah, no, no, exactly, exactly. So, so you get that reverse logic going. And so even your friends are your enemies or even your strengths, your weakness, you know, because they pull for. So the solution to that is you pursue these positive values-based visions, not to get rid of or escape, but because they're intrinsically of importance to you. So if you're exercising because you want to see, uh, you, know, your, your, you know, your kid's wedding, if you're exercising because you want to be able to dance with your uh, husband, if you're exercising because you want to live uh, a long and healthy life, I mean, if, in, in which you will do these wonderful things, you know, it, it's not, as opposed to, or in order to push away that. Now, conversely, if you're exercising so that you're gonna look really great and look really thin and look really slim and not wonder if people find you attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing that so that you're gonna get rid of insecurities about your appearance, uh, you're playing with fire because that insecurity a will probably still show up, you know, how many people have dealt with, you know, with, uh, uh, I, 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 it's gender biased, but it is more typical, let's say with adolescent uh, females who are like pinching their relative, you know, really thin stomachs and saying they're fat. I mean, mm -hmm. body dysmorphic stuff can happen regardless of what your body looks like. Beyond that, even if that didn't happen, hey, I do look good. I literally look good. Yeah, but I don't know if I'm smart enough. I mean, the same thing you just played will play you in another way. And so let's do it a different way. Let's pursue health, prosperity, love, community, contribution by reining in the excesses of that problem solving mind showing up in this moment as a conscious human being and focus on what's important to us. And that'll allow us to do it cleanly in a way where peace of mind and purpose can live together. And you don't have to get to purpose by this uh, muscly attempt to get rid of something when you're dealing with a neurobiology that has no delete buttons other than uh, a physical injury or brain deterioration, neither which you want to wish for. So, you know, your history is not going away. Your insecurities are going to, at least by memory, echo through the rest of your life. If, you know, it, it's more like if you had salty water, add fresh water than it is pick out the salt crystals. Mm -hmm. and, and our mind tells us we'll do better when we subtract and eliminate. And actually that just adds you now have an easier neurobiological track. You know, you can go from, you know, putting on your track shoes to go out and exercise to I'm too fat, even easier. And uh, everything needs to be done uh, cautiously because of that. It's not logical, it's psychological. That's the evolutionary mismatch. We've got, you know, we're riding a tiger. And so, um, yeah, diffusion helps. These diffusion methods that get a little bit of fresh air in there and lets the problem-solving mind know that there's a little more of us watching. There's a little more to us, to us than just uh, doing math problems. Right. And one of the things I really appreciate about the exercises and the way you present them is, you know, this, whether the T is therapy or training, eventually it has to be training. Yeah. Right. Because it's not it's not like a therapy, like I'm going to go for 12 weeks and be cured. These are practices just like doing push ups or sit ups or going for a walk. It's an awesome way to think about it. And then and then think about the how screwed up our cultural conversation is, because we talk about mental health and it, it only applies to the one out of five who are going to have, quote, mental health problems or even worse, mental illness. How about mental health? 
you know, how about mental resilience? And, and you, you, you know, what we do in the psychology area is tantamount to saying to somebody who's a cancer survivor, oh, I'm so sorry that you had cancer. I guess now you're going to have to exercise. <laughs> That's what we do. You know, but because <laughs> with the physical health, we would never do that. We would say, do your push us, do your exercise, you know, work on your flexibility, work on your strength. Why? Because physical health is important. Well, where's the mental training? Where are we doing our mental push-ups? What are they? Mm. And and they're there. And the, the psychological flexibility exercises, you know, I do f psychological flexibility exercises every freaking day. I've been doing it for 40 some years. And by the way, my wife will tell you, I'm still not that good at it. Yeah. But, I, but I say back to my wife, I know I'm not there. I know I'm not. But you should have met me before. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe I'm not, you know, Charles Atlas of mental resilience and mental flexibility, but, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the puny uh, uh, kid getting sand kicked on him going back to those old uh, matchbook uh, uh, things about, um, uh, you know, uh, isometric uh, exercises and stuff back in the day, you know, the Jack LaLanne mm -hmm. uh, kind of stuff. The, you know, we're, we're, um, in need of modern minds for this modern world. The challenges that we all face are such that if we're not doing mental re resilience, flexibility training all the time, we're going to be stumbling psychologically all the time. And uh, look around you and see if that's not what you see. In fact, if you, so it's not one out of five, it's five out of five. Mental health is mental resilience, mental training is a five out of five issue. And if we didn't know that before COVID, don't we know it now? I mean, my 14 year old just went to, off to high school wearing a mask. He's going to be there. He's one day on, one day off. Am I afraid for him and for my wife and I when he comes home? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole world is going through this right now. So if we didn't know it before, we should know it now. Uh, do your push-ups, uh, if not every day, every other day. But uh, I try to do my age every other day in push-ups. It's getting harder, <laughs> but uh, I can still kind of do it. But uh, uh, do the same with your with your mental skills. And the liberated mind gives you the the way to do it. That's why it's acceptance and commitment therapy or acceptance and commitment training. It's the same thing. All right. So I got three, three more questions for you. Yeah. So one is I'm a health coach. I'm not a licensed psychologist. I'm not going to go back to school for psychology. I want to get trained in act. Yeah. How can, I, how can I do that? What's the, what's the easiest way? Cause books are great, but they're not the same as supervision. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and in that community, we embrace this fully. You know, if you were to join the main ACT Society called the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, you'll find that there's a coach's special interest group. There's also a teacher's special interest group. There's a special interest group for physicians. There's a special group for OTs and PTs. And, you know, it, it's, it applies to anybody who works with people. Teachers need to know about this. Coaches need to know about this. So, uh, uh, you know, I open up my online trainings to anybody. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, conflict of interest warning. I do make money from these things. The books uh, as well. But, it, you know, if you were to go to my website, stephenchayes.com, you know, I'll send you my newsletter. I'll send you the you know, blogs, et cetera, let you know about what's going on. But, but people can be, have access to high quality act training um, in any professional role that where you're going to apply those uh, principles. So when I say professional role, that means it, if it's legal, uh, it counts. Okay, yeah. uh, so, uh, you know, in some parts of the world, like we have a, an ACT clinic in Sierra Leone. Well, was in all of Sierra Leone, six and a half million people. There's one retired psychiatrist, one retired psychiatrist, and one psychologist. More than six million people. Mm. You know, so you know, we're out there doing ACT trainings with uh, 
indigenous health workers and with uh, nuns and anyone else, you know, because so the same thing here. So if, if it's legal and you can do it, we'll, we'll help train you and how to do it. The, in the era of COVID, the easiest way is uh, online training. If it's not too commercial, I can mention, uh, no. well, if you put in act.courses, just act.courses, okay. uh, it'll pull up uh, a, my first online course, which is called Act Immersion, which is, uh, was filmed in Hollywood, like a, fi a Hollywood film. I decided if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this at a level of quality that's never been done before. And we, we, we spent an insane amount of money and insane amount of time to do it. We, truly, we literally did it with union level videographers for four days in Hollywood. So. Uh, the quality of the tapes and the interactions and so forth was really cool. It's focused on psychotherapy, but it teaches the principles in such a way, in such a deep way that anyone who does any kind of uh, human development or behavior change work will see the relevance. It's a good thing to get the feel of it by actually watching and listening and seeing, because then the books come alive. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to do more of that. I have a, a new a tape series, that an outfit called Saint Sounds True is just put out. Oh. It's uh, also on Amazon. So it isn't just books. People can hear the exercises, can see them being done in online uh, kinds of things. Okay. But that, uh, that audible book or CD called, uh, it's called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy that Sounds True puts out is another resource. That, okay. Great. So I'll, I'll link to all of these in the show notes for today. And you answered my second question, which is how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Uh, so Stephen yeah. C. Hayes and Stephen with a V. Stephen with a V. Middle C. Charlie is my middle name. H-A-Y-E-S. All one word, no periods dot com. And uh, if you on the landing page, it says, yes, please send it to me. That means you'll get a little seven lesson uh, email uh, description of ACT and a little kind of mini course on ACT, and then you'll get my newsletters. I don't spam people. They come out about every three or four weeks. If you ever get tired of them, it's a one-click opt-out. Okay. Uh, and actually, if you wander around that website, you'll see some things on a liberated mind. I, I posted, uh, you know, tests people can apply to themselves to see how they're doing and their psychological flexibility skills to uh, kind of a, a examples of things they can do to put in their ACT toolkit to learn how to move each of these flexibility, pro each of these processes that are described in a liberated mind. And if you had to pick one book to start with, a liberated mind would be a darn good place to start. Hell yeah. Just came out of paperback two weeks ago. Oh, it's okay. now cheaper. And um, it's kind of wherever books are sold or you can get it through all the online sources great my last question is any music you're listening to now that you're really enjoying that uh, maybe most people haven't heard of oh golly i uh i'm kind of a uh, i tend towards trance techno things like that um it, it's kind of fading away trance techno and all that and i try i like new music rather than uh, older music uh, so lately I've been listening to really soft, soft versions of, uh, 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 that have that kind of, uh, modal quality that don't have a beginning, a middle and end, but sort of go on that kind of Raga esque music that I've drifted towards my entire life. I'm a guitar player. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my first, uh, real hero in guitar was a guy named John Fahey who played these long, uh, kind of Native American guitar, but sound more like um, uh, sitar type music. I mean, because it's uh, it, it's not a one four five chord sequence. It's a mm. mixolydian mode kind of you know four five uh, if if you know that from music. Anyway, there's a, a couple of folks I've been listening to a lot lately. Uh, Jens Burkhart, I think his name, and Theory David. Very soft. Uh, kind of modal music puts you in, uh, it kind of colors your, your room. 
uh, almost like Andy. Okay. All almost right, like I'll, I'll go. I'll go look it up. I haven't heard of any of those. John John Fahey, Jens Jens Burkhard, and Theory David. Yeah, I will look them all up on YouTube and uh, put put some links. Awesome. Yeah, sounds uh, sounds groovy. <laughs> It is. It's actually in a groove. You'll see it's very much get in a groove and just stay there uh, kind of music. Gotcha. Well, there's, there's so much that we haven't talked about, including the social justice work, the transformational work, um, mental illness, and like it's, it's in the book. And I'm yeah. sure it's, it's in your courses and you've been really generous with your time. So I just want to like honor and thank you for like the, the commitment to truth and to service that has clearly informed your career and is just, you know, oozing out of every single page of a liberated mind. It's just, it's, it's so wonderful to, to, be, to be able to get to have a conversation with you about these topics. That's cool. And really, I can see how deeply you have explored it because you're coming at me with interesting and kind of kind of angles. So uh, right back at you. I appreciate the integrity of what it is that you're trying to do here. And, um, you know, I hope that it's of use. I, I can say to people, if they're listening, you know, if, uh, if you're struggling in some way psychologically, you know, uh, there may not be a way out, but there is a way in and, and mm -hmm. science can help you really learn from and prosper inside your particular human journey, uh, even uh, including the parts uh, that are painful and difficult. Uh, in hindsight, you may see that they're uh, 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 as important or maybe even more so than some of the things your mind is telling you you have to have before you can live. All right. Stephen Hayes, thank you so much for all you do and for taking the time today. Awesome opportunity and thank you for providing it. Okay, take care.